Have you had such an event in your life that it remains with you fresh in your mind 30 years later? The event I'm thinking of didn't happen to me directly, but tangentially. And that is, uh, in the same year in the church I was pastoring, two were called to the ministry at the same year. And one of them was a, uh, uh, a member of the church. The other one was actually uh, my wife's cousin. And he was called to the uh, pulpit laying vinyl in my bathroom. And that should be fair warning <laughs> about any that do maintenance in the parsonage. It's, you never know where God's going to show up. You just don't know. Uh, but the, the fellow that was the church member, the non-family, um, he came to me in distress one day. He said, now Earl, they keep telling me at work. He was working in a, a factory in an area of many factories. And uh, he said, they keep telling me it's not going to last. It's not real. This is just something you're going through. It's, it's, it's just something, a phase that's passing. And Benny was obviously exceedingly upset, and I made some kind of remark about, well, it's just easier to tear others down than it is to look at your own self. But he came to me a couple of weeks later. It was right after church, and he was ready to cry. And uh, it just does something to me when I see a big old boy, almost my size, almost grown, uh, just tearing up. He said, Earl, in Sunday school I'll go to speak, and they'll just ignore me like they can't hear me, and just continue talking. And they won't let me talk. I said, congratulations, you've just been ordained. <laughs> Did not did not help him one iota. But um, I thought about that, and I prayed about that, and I preached a sermon a Sunday or two later entitled, Bless Be the Tie That Binds, It Sometimes Also Gags. And the thing is, in my experience, and in the experience of those that I've ministered with, the hardest place to declare oneself for the Lord is among family and the people you were raised with. And I distinctly remember the first sermon I ever preached, December 26, 1982, at Lambeth Memorial in Jackson, Tennessee. And just as I was approaching the pulpit for the first service, the sound man made a mistake and said, now Earl, we're going to tape this. And I thought to myself, no, you're not. And I preached far enough away from the pulpit, Mike, they couldn't pick me up. But I spoke loud enough that the congregation could, for the most part, hear me. Second service, he said, there was something wrong with that microphone, but I've tested it, and it's working this time, and I have turned the gain up full on that microphone. I thought, it's <laughs> not going to help. <laughs> now, if I could just figure out how to erase the version in heaven, the copy that was laid down on the scroll in heaven. You know, hardest place to preach is among your own people, those that know you best. And, and certainly part of it is by knowing us, we've become so familiar that we've been categorized and put in a slot and given an understanding. And, and it's hard to get people to look at us new and fresh. Blessed be the tie that binds it sometimes also gags. Jesus had that problem in his first sermon. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4, at verse 16 following. When he came to Nazareth, 
Let me back up and read it 14 following. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about Him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to preach and teach in their synagogues, and was praised by everyone. Now pause there. That's out in the country. That's out in the the surrounding territory. Praised by everyone. 16, when He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up, He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was His custom. Now pause there. If you don't get anything else out of the message, hear the words, as was His custom. He was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was His custom. Synagogue does not equate to church. In that day, if you belonged to the household and people of God, you worshipped, you made sacrifice in Jerusalem in the temple. But if you can't make it every Sabbath to worship, you can go to Sunday school and study, and that was what synagogue was. And so even if they can't make it to church, they could at least make it to Sunday school, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it is written, Pause there. Why did he have to find the place where it was written? They had not yet divided up Scripture, Old Testament or New, into chapter or verses. Scholars tell us that the Bible was divided up into chapters in around the 12th century and divided up further into verses around the 14th century. Can I tell you, I think that's a tool of the devil. Because... We think we can read a verse in isolation and think we understand the Word of God. If the devil can't stop us from reading the Bible, he will at least get get us to read it in isolation so that it seems like every verse stands alone by itself. A text without a context is a pretext. Now remember that. And found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me. He has, can I tell you a better translation? He has Christed me. Christ, not a name, a title from Christos, anointed one. He has made me the Christ to bring good news to the poor. As long as I'm doing word studies, good news. In the Greek, euangel. If you change the Y to a V, you get the transliteration evangel, the good news. So evangelism is nothing but good news-ism. To evangelize is, in fact, by definition, to share the good news. What good news? That which comes in Jesus Christ. Because He has anointed me, He has made me the Christ, then I have good news to bring to whom? The poor. Again, I'm in Bible study now, so don't count this as preaching. Now, if we were in Matthew's Gospel, it would tell us poor in spirit. That's how it it comes to us on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, those that people that know that they have a poverty inside, internal, a spiritual poverty. And yes, that's true, and it needs to be in the Bible, but Luke doesn't say blessed are the poor in spirit. In the equivalent in Luke's Gospel, the Sermon on the Plain versus the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew's Gospel, Luke tells us, blessed are the poor. If your Gospel does not include doing something about those who have nothing, 
if you have something, that gospel does not belong to Jesus Christ. That's what this text says. Blessed are the poor, Dr. Luke would tell us, Jesus said. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What is that? In Hebrew scripture, you read about the year of Jubilee. Happens every 50 years. Their time in that day is divided into segments of seven. A week is seven days. And so on the seventh day, you have Sabbath. A day not to goof off. And if you go to the lake or to the river, at least appreciate who made it. Pause there and say, thank you, Lord, I know that's from you. I'm just saying. But in addition to seven days, you can have seven years. And you can have a Sabbath year as well as a Sabbath day. But occasionally, you can have a Sabbath of Sabbaths. That's what happened to give us Pentecost. Pentecost from the Greek, 50 days. How in the world do you get 50 days? Well, you have seven sevens and the next day. Seven times seven, come on. 49, 49, thank you very much. On the next day, 50. And so 50 days after the resurrection, you've got Pentecost because the, uh, the crucifixion happened at the Passover. And as you read in Hebrew scripture, after Passover is the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. A Feast of Weeks is a week of weeks, seven times seven. And the next day after seven sevens, the 50th day, you have the Shavuot service Feast of Weeks. It's a Thanksgiving celebration. It's a time not when the harvest is in. That's when you and I say thanks to God. It's when the harvest first has the first produce. First ear of corn, or as you'd say it around here, the first tomato ripe. You, sh- you bring it to church and show everybody, don't you? You know how you are. You bring it to church. And so we have a feast of weeks. Well, every seven years you have a celebration, but you can have a seven-seventh. Seven times seven, 49 still. Math hasn't changed that much. The next year, after seven sevens, after a Sabbath of years, you can have a Sabbath of Sabbath of years, and the next year is called Jubilee. It's the year of the Lord's favor. Now, all this is Hebrew scripture. I'm just giving you background. And in the year of the Lord's favor, the slaves are set free. In the year of the Lord's favor, if you've sold land, it comes back to you. In the year of the Lord's favor, in the Jubilee year, it's called, the whole land lies fallow. No one works. You eat the stores that have been laid aside in preparation And Jesus stands up and pronounces that he has been sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, a jubilee, slaves set free. If you've had to sell that piece of property that you inherited from grandma or grandpa, it's back. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Pause. You stand up to preach scripture, but what was the posture in preaching? You sit down. I'm just saying. You don't have to imitate Jesus, but that's what he did. Just saying. And sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture 
has been fulfilled in your hearing. And this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the mighty, precious name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Next week, we'll get into the response of the people to Jesus' proclamation that today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Next week, we'll hear about the fuss. Next week. We've got enough to do just to deal with this. Two tools Jesus has when he goes home to preach his first hometown sermon. He has the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in his life. He has the Bible. That's what he needed. My question this morning is, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit in Scripture, what do you need? Especially if you want to live among the people that know you the best and live for the Lord, what do you need? He had the Holy Spirit. People will today say that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak. Well, technically he might not speak to you. If you've already decided you're not going to listen to God, why should he waste the words? But to those to whom he knows will listen. God is still talking. Now, Dr. Luke, portraying Jesus here, has him as a modern-day Elijah, that everything that Jesus does is directed in the moment by the Father. It's sort of surprising. I mentioned this last week. It's sort of surprising. Jesus will say, no, I'm not going to do that, and then 30 seconds later, do it. And the whole point is that every footstep, every word, every action is directed from heaven. And you're thinking, well, that's just Jesus. No, that's whoever will listen to God. But if you've already decided that, no, certain things are too hard, certain things are against my personal beliefs, why would God speak we're told in, Hebrew, in uh, Hebrews, not Hebrew Scripture, but in the book of Hebrews, that every son the Lord loves, He chastens. Chastens. Back in my days as a child, we would say, take into the woodshed. Every son He loves. You know, if, if God is not taking you to the woodshed at some point, either, either literally or figuratively, you really need to ask, Lord, am I even a child of yours? The Holy Spirit corrects and directs. Yes, the Holy Spirit empowers and gives miraculous gifts. But if you haven't been taken to the woodshed lately, as in this morning, you might ask God the question, do I really belong to you? We have the tool of the Holy Spirit, the person, the third person of the Trinity. We also have Holy Scripture. What happens when the people of God get together and Jesus shows up to do something for them? They listen to Jesus read the Bible. Isn't that marvelous? If nothing else today... You got to hear the Bible as the people of God, collective. Can I tell you something special happens when we get to listen? God's Word comes alive. It's, it's breathing. It's, it's powerful. It's able to divide even soul from spirit. And that's what Jesus turned to when it's time to go home among those who know him the best or at least think they've got him figured out and put in a slot. Now, next week we're going to hear Jesus gets out of that slot and almost loses his life. But for today, understand, the same Holy Spirit that worked in his life is still working in lives for those who will listen and receive. World's largest church capped itself at 800,000 members. Senior pastor said, well, you know when it's big enough. You just, you just got to stop somewhere. 
he made an offer some years ago. He'll give 20,000 members to anybody who is competent and will come and pastor those people. He'll give you a starting congregation of 20,000 members. Pastor David Yong Cho in Seoul, South Korea, says he built that church on three words. Three words. Pray and obey. How does the Holy Spirit move? Same way it always moved. Among those willing to receive the presence of God. And when it came time to share, Jesus started by sharing what he had of the Bible. No, we wouldn't call it the full Bible. What he had that day we would call today Old Testament or Hebrew Scripture. The canon has been completed. It's been closed. But the point is, he's still giving us advice. Look to the Bible. Come together regularly. The word said, as was his habit. Come together regularly and listen to the Bible. Let God speak. Now, he does add to that. He sits down and he said, those promises y'all been looking forward to, they're all true. Daddy makes them come true in me. Look one more time at the promises Good news to the poor. Release to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. Let the oppressed go free. Proclaim the jubilee of God, the year of the Lord's favor. In Christ, every promise comes true. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.